Welcome to the Discover Prophetic Truth in Scripture broadcast with your host, Dr. Anthony Earl. We will unpack the Word so that the strategies of God can be revealed. This program airs daily at 8 a.m. Pacific, 10 a.m. Central, 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Follow us in studying the entire Bible this year. We pray that this teaching helps to bring God's Word to life and gives you practical application to enhance your daily living. Let's go right into today's teaching. So this morning, as we are moving through Kings, Proverbs, and 2 Corinthians, we want to keep in mind that we are asking Holy Spirit to give us insight, to open our minds, our understanding, to give us wisdom. Let us receive what we need, the specific things that we need today that will encourage us and build us up in faith. Stir us, stir us to the utmost in the name of Jesus. So today, today our thought, it's an interesting thought because many times we avoid thoughts like this. We want thoughts that will attract people, positive thoughts, thoughts that will not challenge their, their uh, lifestyle, but uh, the thoughts that will provoke people to become covetous and, and warning things. But I realized throughout the years walking with God, that is important to, to self-care, to deal with yourself, to address those sins and those, those issues that have set you apart, that have separated and alienated you from God. So today, when we go into Corinthians, Paul is going to address uh, cleansing ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. And as we see and track throughout the scriptures, we can see th that this is necessary. This is necessary that we, we work hard to untangle ourselves from the yoke of bondage. We must untangle ourselves. We must work out our soul salvation with fear and trembling. And I know it's a battle for many of you, for all of us have battled, but there's no temptation which is common unto man by which God has not given you a way to escape. So you want, you have to priority, prioritize your love for God over those fleshy passions. So today's theme is let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. Let us cleanse ourselves. The wisdom of God is given to us so that we can untangle ourselves from the yoke of bondage. So let's go right into 1 Kings chapter 13, and we'll see how Israel continued to spiral down because they refused to obey the commands and the statues of God. And let us take note and learn that there are rewards for those who are faithful to obeying the word of God. And there are mm -hmm, wages for those who refuse to adhere to the word of God. First Kings, First Kings chapter 13 is our book. And behold, a man of God went from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. Then he cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, behold, a child Josiah by name shall be born to the house of David and on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who burnt incense on you and men's bones shall be burned on you. Such a powerful prophetic word. And this prophet is an unnamed, it's an unnamed man. The prophecy by this unnamed man of God against Jeroboam is truly remarkable since it names and describes the actions of Josiah almost 300 years before this king comes on the scene. Prophecy isn't locked in a Kronos context. 
and chronos has to do with uh, uh, chronological or like uh, seconds, minutes, uh, hours, days, weeks, months, years. It's not blocked in that. It's the, the, there are set times when we speak prophetic words. There are set times for those prophetic words to come into fruition. And here, the man of God spoke and prophesied so powerfully. Can you imagine speaking to an altar and exactly how he called it happened? And we will read about that a little later on as we continue to navigate through the book of Kings. Verse three, and he gave a sign the same day saying, this is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Surely the altar shall split apart and the ashes on it shall be poured out. Now I want to encourage you that when you speak the word of the Lord by unction, by the leading of the spirit, just allow the Debar word to do its work. Don't try to help it. Once the word is released, the word is like a, a, a release time capsule. Back in the day, they would have time release uh, pills that when you uh, consume it, it, it released its, its, its energy or its product in certain amount of times. The prophetic word will unfold at the exact time that God has intended it. We only prophesy in part. We only know in part. So Jeroboam's altar would split apart to illustrate God's dis displeasure with the idolatry that resulted from Jeroboam's influence and to give a sign affirming the prophecy about Josiah. We must seek God earnestly for authenticity we must seek God that today there will be a separation of the wheat of the tear, the sheep and the goat, a separation of the false church and the true church, the church of God and the church of men. We must pray and ask God that he will he would work with us and make us into his true son so that we too can prophesy with prophetic accuracy and proficiency. So it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God who cried out against the altar in Bethel, that he stretched out his hand from the altar saying, arrest him. Then his hand, which he stretched out towards him withered so that he could not pull it back to himself. We must seek and ask God for signs and wonders, not to build our faith, but signs and wonders so that it may impact those who are not part of the beloved, that signs and wonders come for the unbeliever to help them to understand that true, truly there is a living God. So since the hand symbolizes authority, the withering of Jeroboam's hand demonstrated the superiority of God's authority. God is in control. God is in charge. Verse five. The altar also was split apart and the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. Some think Jeroboam betrays the sinful condition of his heart when he refers to the Lord, not as my God, but as your God. However, in light of the use of the phrase in verse chapters 2, verse 3 and Genesis 27, 20, this may not necessarily be so. Verse seven, excuse me, verse six. <clears throat> then the king answered and said to the man of God, please entreat favor of the Lord your God and pray with me that my hand may be restored to me so that the man of God entreated the Lord and the king's hand was restored to him and became as before. Then the king said to the man of God, come home with me and refresh yourself and I will give you a reward. But the man of God said to the king, if you were to give me half your house, I would not go in with you, nor would I eat bread, nor drink water in this place. For so it was commanded me by the word of the Lord saying, you shall not eat bread, nor drink water, nor return by the same way you came. 
So to eat bread or drink water, sharing bread and water was a sign of hospitality. God's clear direction was to avoid any kind, any, excuse me, any contact of this kind. Verse 10. So he went another way and did not return by the way he came to Bethel. Now an old prophet dwelt in Bethel and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. They also told their father the words which he had spoken to the king. So this incident of the seduction of the man of God, though somewhat confusing, serves to portray how even this man of God had been affected by the evil influence of Jeroboam. And their father said to them, which way did he go? For his sons had seen which way the man of God went, who came from Judah. Then he said to his son, saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled the donkey for him and he rode on it and went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. Then he said to him, are you, are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said to him, come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I cannot return with you nor go in with you. Neither can I eat bread nor drink water in, excuse me, with you in this place. For I have been told by the word of the Lord, you shall not eat bread nor drink water there, nor return by going the way you came. He said to him, I too am a prophet as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord saying, bring him back with you to your house that he may eat bread and drink water. He was lying to him. So in this day, we must discern the spirit of truth from the spirit of lying. For people will come in pretense. People will say that they are apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers and evangelists, but they are deceivers. So he went back with him and ate bread in his house and drank water. Now it happened as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. Why did God deal so harshly with the man of God and not the prophet when both were disobedient? Perhaps it was because the sin of the man of God would have brought doubt upon the prophecies he had just given and would have impinged on God's reliability. This explains the action of the older prophet in verses 31 and 32. And he cried out to the man of God who came from Judah saying, thus says the Lord, because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord and have not kept the commandments which the Lord your God commanded you, but you came back, ate bread, drank water in the place of which the Lord said to you, eat no bread and drink no water. Your corpse shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. So it was after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk that he settled the donkey for him, the prophet whom he had brought back. When he was gone, a lion met him on the road and killed him and his corpse was thrown on the road and the donkey stood by it. The lion also stood by the corpse. How many people have made the terrible mistakes of not obeying the word of the Lord? And it cost them their careers. It cost them their life. It cost them their family. It cost them their possessions. This is why it's important that we must be determined to cleanse ourselves from disobedience, rebellion, the filthiness of the flesh, all of the fleshly activities that take place in our lives. Verse 24. When he had was gone, a lion met him on the road and killed him, and his corpse was thrown on the water, road, and the donkey stood by it. The lion also stood by the corpse. Donkey symbolized humility, stubbornness, burden bearer, without understanding. Understanding is crucial for discerning deception. The lion represents authority. Jesus Christ, judgment. The young prophet was judged severely because he disobeyed God. 
Verse 25. And there men passed by and saw the corpse thrown on the road and the lion stand standing by the corpse. Then they went and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. Now, when the prophet who had brought him back from the way heard it, he said, it is the man of God who was disobedient to the word of the Lord. Therefore, the Lord has delivered him to the lion, which has torn him and killed him according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke to him. And he spoke to his sons saying, saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled it. Then he went and found his corpse thrown on the road and the donkey and the lion standing by the corpse. The lion had not eaten the corpse nor torn the donkey. And the prophet took up the corpse of the man of God, laid it on the donkey and brought it back. So the old prophet came to the city to mourn and to bury him. Then he laid the corpse in his own tomb and they mourned over him saying, alas, my brother. So it was after he had buried him that he spoke to his son saying, when I am dead, then bury me in the tomb where the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones for the same which he cried out by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the shrines on the high places which are in the cities of Samaria will surely come to pass. So Samaria would become the capital city of the 10 Northern tribes. The cities of Samaria then is a designation for the whole territory of the nation of Israel. Even after this incident with the man of God, Jeroboam still did not turn from his evil way. Not only had Jeroboam ordained his own priesthood, but now he made himself one of the priests of the high places. For this final act of apostasy, God would exterminate and destroy the house of Jeroboam. After this event, Jeroboam did not turn from his evil way, but again, he made priests from every class of people for the high places. Whoever wished, he consecrated him, and he became one of the priests of the high places. And this thing was the sin of the house of Jeroboam, so as to exterminate and destroy it from the face of the earth. First Kings chapter 14. And the time Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, became sick. And Jeroboam said to his wife, please arise and disguise yourself that they may not recognize you as the wife of Jeroboam and go to Shiloh. Indeed, Ahijah, the prophet is there who told me that I would be king over this people. Also take with you 10 loaves, some cakes and a jar of honey and go to him. He will tell you what will become of the child. And Jeroboam's wife did so. She arose and went to Shiloh and came to the house of Ahijah. But Ahijah could not see, for his eyes were glazed by reason of his age. Now the Lord had said to Ahijah, Here is the wife of Jeroboam coming to you, coming to ask you something about her son, for he is sick. Thus and thus you shall say to her, for it will be when she comes in that she will pretend to be another woman. This seat is a work of witchcraft. The intent of it is to cast a, cast a spell of blindness. It is designed to hide the truth. Physically, a high job vision was impaired, but spiritually his sight was divinely 2020. Verse six. And so it was when Ahijah heard the sounds of her footsteps as she came through the door, he said, come in, wife of Jeroboam. Why do you pretend to be another person? For I have been sent to you with bad news. Go tell Jeroboam, thus says the Lord God of Israel, because I exalted you from among the people and made you ruler over my people Israel and tore the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you. And yet you have not been as my servant David, who kept my commandments and who followed me with all his heart. 
to do only what was right in my eyes. But you have done more evil than all who were before you, for you have gone and made for yourselves other gods and, and molded images to provoke me to anger and have cast me behind your back. God entrusted the kingdom into, into our hands. Our obedience guaranteed the longevity of our rule. Faithfulness determines the breadth and the length of it. Jeroboam did more evil than all who were before him. His evil, excuse me, disentitled his descendants from reigning on the throne. Therefore, I will bring disaster on the house of Jeroboam and will cut off Jeroboam every male in Israel, bond and free. I will take away the remnant of the house of Jeroboam as one takes away refuge until it is all gone. The dog shall eat whoever belongs to Jeroboam and die in the city. And the birds of the air shall eat whoever dies in the field. For the Lord has spoken. Arise, therefore, go to your own house. When your feet enter the city, the child shall die. Verse 13. And all Israel shall mourn for him and bury him, for he is the only one of Jeroboam who shall come to the grave, because in him there, there is found something good towards the Lord God of Israel in the house of Jeroboam. Moreover, the Lord will raise up for himself a king over Israel who shall cut off the house of Jeroboam. This is the day. What even now? So according to the prophecy of Ahijah, all the male descendants of Jeroboam would die and be unburied. The exception to this was Abijah. Abijah received an honorable burial because in him there is found something good towards the Lord God of Israel. What this something good refers to is unclear. Perhaps Abijah had not been corrupt since he was still a child. This predicts the actions of Basha against Nadab in chapters 15, 27 to 29. Verse 15, for the Lord will strike Israel as a reed is shaken in the water. He will uproot Israel from this good land, which he gave to their fathers and will scatter them beyond the rivers because they have made their wooden images provoking the Lord to anger. And he will give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam, who sinned and who made Israel sin. Then Jeroboam's wife arose and departed and came to Terzah. When she came to the threshold of the house, the child died and they buried him and all Israel mourned for him according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke through his servant, Ahijah the prophet. So Ahijah's prophecy points towards the captivity of Israel by Assyria in 722 BC. Jer Jeroboam had moved from Shishkim to Terza. Terza was the capital city of, northern king of the northern kingdom until Israel's sixth king, Omri, built Samaria and made it the seat of government. Verse 19. Now the rest of the acts of Jeroboam, how he made war and how he reigned, indeed they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. The period that Jeroboam reigned was 22 years, so he rested with his fathers. Then Nadab, his son, reigned in this place. So the book of Chronicles of the kings of Israel. This is not to be confused with the Old Testament book of one, first and second chronicles, which were written later than first and second kings. Compare date introductions. From the time of David, several individuals acted as recorders of the events experienced by God's people in the kingdom period. Such historical documents would have been kept in the royal archives. These records were probably a source for 1st and 2nd Kings 
since such chronicles are mentioned 32 times in 1 Kings. So the Holy Spirit then guided the author to select the records, the, the events found in 1 and 2 Kings. Nadab means liberal, generous. He's the second king of Israel. So remember, there is the northern kingdom, which is called Israel, and the southern kingdom, which is called Judah. The, the northern kingdom had 10 tribes. The southern kingdom had two. Verse 21. Now Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned in Judah. Rehoboam was 41 years old when he became king. He reigned 17 years in Jerusalem the city which the Lord had, had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. His mother's name was Naamath, an Ammonitess. Now Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins, which they committed more than all that their fathers had done. For they also built themselves high places, sacred pillows, and wooden images on every high hill and under every green tree. So under Rehoboam, the southern kingdom of Judah was not doing any better than, the, than Israel to the north. Their sinful state made them no match for the invasions of Shishak of Egypt, which Second Chronicles 12 regards as divine retribution. Shishak also invaded Israel at the same time. His object was to gain control of the major trade routes from Arabia to Damascus. So Judah is influenced by their neighbor's idolatrous practices. They too did evil in the sight of God and provoked him to jealousy. Verse 24, and there were also perverted persons in the land. They did according to all the abominations of the nations, which the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. So perverted is the word Kadash. It means perverted, sodomites, homosexuals. So we see that these lewd behaviors existed in antiquity as we see them uh, taking place in our contemporary times. Verse 25, it happened in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem and he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He took away everything. He also took away all the gold shields which Solomon had made. So what do you see? You can see now because of their lifestyle, loss is coming. Loss is coming. What God blessed them to have, now the devourer has come to take it away. And this is why we study the scriptures so that we can understand how God operates and how we can be forgiven and be quick to ask God for forgive, forgiveness and begin to walk right in his word. And then he will rebuke the devourer for our sake. Then King Rehoboam made bronze shields in their place and committed them to the hands of the captains of the guards who guarded the doorway of the king's house. So because of their wickedness, they lost their royal treasuries. Poverty is a consequence of practicing evil. Verse 8, 28. And whenever the king entered the house of the Lord, the guards carried them, then brought them back into the guard room. Now the rest of the acts of Rehoboam and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the King of Judah? And there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all their days. So Rehoboam Boam rested with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. His mother's name was Naamath, an Ammonitess. Then Abijam, his son reigned in his place. So the chronicles, the records of events is found in first and second Kings. Proverbs chapter five. My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Lend your ear to my understanding. 
that you may preserve discretion and your lips may keep knowledge. So listen to and do not stray from this wise instruction. Run, keep away from the adulterer and the prostitute. Do not allow your heart to be drawn to their ways. Remain faithfully devoted to the one you marry. Let the love of your spouse alone satisfy you. So here, the wisdom. This is the second reference in the scriptures that we are going to uh, encounter that has to do with fidelity. It's important to understand just as we were clued when we studied in the book of numbers we studied how balaam plotted to defeat israel by uh giving barak the 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 plan to seduce them with the women so that the sexual relationships would lead them eventually to turning away from their god and pursuing other gods so it's important to understand that one of the battle lines that the enemy attacks us in is in the area of sexuality. Verse three, for the lips of an immoral woman slash or man drips honey and her mouth is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as two edged swords. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lay hold of hell, lest you ponder her path of life. Her ways are unstable. You do not know them. So the stark picture of the seductress ends with the warning. This is the second reference to the immoral woman. Wormwood, a plant known in the ancient world for its bitterness. Verse 5. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lay hold of hell, lest you ponder her path of life. Her ways are unstable. You do not know them. Therefore, hear me now, my children, and do not depart from the word of my mouth. Remove your way far from her and do not go near the door of her house. Now, this is where the line is drawn because people who are challenged by lust, those who are driven by compulsive desires to sleep around, right here is where the line is drawn. You must make up in your mind that you're going to live right. Or if you continue to play with fire, you will get burnt because the feet of the person who seduces you will easily lead you down to death, and straight to hell. This is what Proverbs is saying. Verse 9 lest you give your honor to her others and your years to the cruel one, lest aliens be filled with your rep, your wealth and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. And this is what we just read and seen in First Kings. As we read First Kings, we, we took note of this in, in chapter 13 and 14, how as Israel became more depraved, then the enemy came in and took their goods, spoiled their goods. Verse 11, and you mourn at last when your flesh and your body are consumed and say, how have, how I have hated instruction and my heart despised corruption, cor correction. I have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined my ear to those who instructed me. I was on the verge of total ruin in the midst of the assembly and congregation. So to ignore the warning of verse eight brings remorse and misery. If King Solomon's son were to involve himself with foreign women, the literal sense of this verse is clear. However, there is application to anyone who hands his purity to a physical or spiritual seducer. seducer. Verse 15, drink water from your own sister and running water from your own well. Drink from your own well, my son. Be faithful and true to your wife. Fidelity safeguards your marriage. First, with metaphors, 
water, fountains, streams. Then with literal description, faithfulness in marriage is called for. Verse 16. Should your fountains be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be only your words and not, excuse me, let them be only your own and not the strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth as a loving deer and a graceful doe. Let her breast satisfy you all times and always be enraptured with her love. For why should you, my son, be enraptured by an immoral woman and be embraced in the arms of a seductress? For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord and he ponders all his path, his own iniquities and trap the wicked man. And he is caught in, his, in the cords of his sin. He shall die for lack of instruction and in the greatness of his folly, he shall go astray. So know that God sees all of the things that we do. Turn away from iniquity and sin. It will trap you and keep you captive like one who is bound with a strong rope, never hidden from God. The sinner comes to a pitiful end. He will die for lack of self-control. He will be lost because of his great foolishness. He shall die for lack of instructions. Again, in the greatness of his folly, he shall go astray. So instruction is the word musa. Instruction, chastisement, warning. It is discipline that teaches one how to live correctly in the fear of the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of, the, of God. So cleanse yourself from all that degrades or corrupts your body and spirit. Do this by asking Jesus for forgiveness and turning from sin. Live in holiness in sincere respect for God. These promises that God will dwell among us, receive us and be our father should motivate us to holiness as should be proper fear of God. Perfecting, epitelio, means to fulfill completely, accomplish. So verse two, Open your hearts to us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupt no one. We have cheated no one. So the integrity of heart, Paul is helping us to understand the importance of walking upright, resuming the appeal be, that begun in chapter 6, 13. Paul notes that no one in the Corinthians church has a just accusation against him. So the culture of the believer cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh, cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the spirit, perfecting holiness and the fear of God, opening our hearts to godly leadership, wrong no one, corrupt no one, cheat no one, in our hearts to die together and to live together, boldness of speech towards the saints, boasting on your behalf, filled with comfort, joyful in all our tribulation. Verse five, for indeed, we came to Macedonia. Our bodies had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts, inside were fears. So after a long digression since chapter 2, 13, chapter 2, verse 13, Paul resumes the description of his travels and the acute anxiety he experienced while waiting to hear news from Corinth through Titus, verse six. Nevertheless, God who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with which he was comforted in you. When he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. 
So Titus brought the good news that the Corinthians had reconciled themselves to Paul and had responded to his severe letter with repentance and obedience, which brought his comfort or encouragement and joy. Downcast is tapinios. It means literally low to the ground. Metaphorically, the word signifies low estate, lowly in position and power, humble. Verse eight, for even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I perceive that the same epistles made you sorry, though only for a while. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance, for you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. I did regret it. Paul briefly felt pain in causing them sorrow, but the resulting repentance with this lasting benefits made the pain worthwhile. Suffer loss from us. Paul's letter had not hurt them, but helped them. Godly sorrow. Their response of turning towards God and repentance brought salvation, which would not be regretted. So sometimes we we find it difficult to to address certain issues in the in the lives of those people that we either lead or we have close relationship with. But at the end of the day, what God is inspiring us to say will ultimately produce great results. Repentance is an essential turning point in reconciled relationships. It requires ownership of our responsibility for whatever part we may have played in erecting or reinforcing barriers. I've learned throughout the years that people are not able to successfully reconcile relationships because they have not understood the principles of taking the responsibility for your transgression. Taking the responsibility is, is to repent, is to repent. And once you repent, repentance sets in an operational system of healing. Repentance not only accepts responsibility for the part that we have played in the wall building, but also for the turning away from the behavior that built the wall in the first place. Often we may not even perceive how we may have unintentionally contributed to divisions between people individually or between ethnic groups in general, especially through ethnic discrimination or religious sectarianism. Perhaps we have not done anything personally to hurt others, but still we may have sinned by our inaction for the body of Christ to come to health, repentance, regret, confession and action is needed. As we do repent, the walls built through blindness and separatism will be brought down and Christ will be honored through reconciled relationships. So take ownership, initiate. This is why it's important to study the scriptures because as we study the scriptures, we, we come across those principles like uh, found in Matthew 18, that if if your brother offends you, go to him. Be quick to, to initiate some process of reconciliation by repenting. Or if you, if, if you think your brother has an offense against you, go to him. Matthew chapter 6. So these principles are embedded within the text, and we must embrace these principles in order to become powerful and healthy believers in Christ. Verse 11, for observe this very thing that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you. What clearing of yourselves. What indignation, what fear, what vehement desires. What zeal, what vindication. In all things, you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. So the Corinthians' energetic response was gratifying to Paul. 
Its depth was characterized by an indignation towards the offender and the offense, alarm over the problem, fear, longing or affection towards Paul, vehement desire and readiness to see justice done, vindication. The church also took a stand against Verse 12, therefore, although I wrote to you, I did not do it for the sake of him who had done the wrong, nor for the sake of him who suffered wrong, but that you, our care for you in the sight of God might appear to you. Therefore, we have been comforted in your comfort, and we rejoice exceedingly more for the joy of, the, of Titus, because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. For if in anything I have boasted to him about you, I am not ashamed. But as we spoke all things to you in truth, even so our boasting to Titus was found true. Not ashamed, that is, you did not let me down. Verse 15, and his affections are greater for you as he remembers the obedience of you all how with fear and trembling you received him. Therefore, I rejoice that I have confidence in you in everything. Fear and trembling, they demonstrated respect and difference to the apostles' representatives. So great word, great word. So we must understand that we must cleanse ourselves from these attitudes, from bitterness and harboring grudges, walking in unforgiveness, backbiting these manifestations of the flesh that we will um, learn about more when we go into the book of Galatians and read Galatians chapter five. It speaks of the fruit of the spirit and the workings of the flesh. So this word was a blessing. Thank you for joining Dr. Earl for today's broadcast. Please be sure to follow us on our website at anthonyearl.org. To make a ministry donation, you can visit anthonyearl.org and click on the donation tab, or you can text to give. Simply text the word GIVE to 773-245-1640. Follow the broadcast on YouTube and join our Facebook group, Anthony Earl Ministries, Discover Prophetic Truth in Scripture. This program airs daily at 8 a.m. Pacific, 10 a.m. Central, 11 a.m. Eastern Time. 